So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Renee Klajic. I'm a reporter at El Paso Matters, your local nonprofit, nonpartisan news source. My pronouns are she, her, and I've been reporting on issues and news that affect queer El Pasoans throughout the past year. Um, so for tonight's event, we're going to be talking about El Paso's vibrant and diverse LGBTQ plus community. I'm really excited to introduce you to our amazing panelists who have wide ranging backgrounds and perspectives when it comes to the local queer scene. Our panelist Diamond Briseño is the co-volunteer director <laughs> for El Paso Sun City Pride and has been a powerful voice for transgender rights in our community through her advocacy work. She's also a fixture in El Paso's queer nightlife scene as, and is an amazing performer. Our panelist Adri Perez has been a strong advocate in Texas speaking out on LGBTQ plus rights issues as part of their work with the ACLU on the sexuality and gender equality team. Even before joining the ACLU, Adri established themselves as a bold voice for political organizing on issues related to queer rights here in El Paso. And then our third panelist, Ben Science, has authored award-winning books that have sold millions of copies around the world. His young adult novel, Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe, received widespread acclaim as a coming of age exploration of sexual identity. Even though we can't all hear each other, I kind of want to just like take a moment to like applaud our panelists, can we? <laughs> um, thank you all so much for being here tonight. I'm really excited that we're here together for this event. I'm also delighted to share that tonight's event is being sponsored by Literary Bookshop which is an independent and locally owned bookstore here in El Paso that strongly supports local authors and often carries the work of one of our panelists tonight. Literarity is located at 5411 North Mesa if you wanna check them out. Thanks, I think we're a beautiful team too. <laughs> um, this event is part of El Paso Matters ongoing conversation series with El Pasoans where we discuss important issues and perspectives that shape our community. At the end of this panel, we're gonna open it up to your questions, but please feel free to put questions in the chat at any point throughout the conversation so we can make sure to get to as many of them as possible. Before starting this conversation, I wanna say a brief word about language. During the panel, I'm gonna be using the word queer as an umbrella term. And by that, I'm referring to the LGBTQ plus community as a whole. Not everyone may agree with this linguistic choice and the term queer has its own history of being reclaimed after primarily being used as a derogatory term in the past. It's important for us to acknowledge how much meaning is wrapped up in the language choices that we make when it comes to talking about gender and sexual identities. And it's also important that you, our audience, feel comfortable voicing if either you don't understand a term that's being used or if you have a suggestion for a more inclusive way to talk about an issue or topic. So that being said, please feel free to drop any linguistic questions or comments in the chat too, and I'll do my best to respond to them or integrate them into our conversation as we go. Um, but with that, let's get started. Um, so I'd like to begin with some introductions. Uh, Diamond and Ben, uh, I'm hoping that each of you can just take a couple minutes to introduce yourselves to the audience. Um, first, by sharing your pronouns. Second, by telling us a little bit about yourself. And then third, by sharing a specific memory of an event or impactful moment in El Paso's LGBTQ plus community that you either witnessed or were a part of. Okay, Adri, let's start with you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> There's a lot of names in the participants or attendees list that I recognize, and it's uh, it's good to feel supported. Um, so hi, my name is Adri Perez. My pronouns are they, them. I'm a queer, transgender, first-generation immigrant from El Paso, Texas. Um, and I have the honor and privilege of working as the LGBTQ equality policy and advocacy strategist for the ACLU of Texas. <laughs> um, in a lot of ways, I have my dream job. So I, I feel very lucky to be able to do, to do this work um, from the position of power that I am able to do it from. Um, I, a favorite Pride memory. Um, actually, so today I was going through photos, trying to find photos um, of like different LGBTQ events um, that we've done in El Paso. And I found a photo from this 2015 fashion show that we did called um, Justicia. And we hosted this event at Epic Rail Yard when it was barely opening up. 
And uh, we did this event uh, where we pre-recorded people's stories. And as they were walking the runway in different sponsored outfits, the stories would play over the runway walk. And um, for me, I shared my coming out story as a transgender person. And we actually had um, several trans women that were participating as part of that event and several other trans masculine and gender non-binary people as well. <clears throat> At the time, um, Dr. Stout, Dr. Kathleen Stout, said that it was um, the most uh, revolutionary culture change event that she had ever attended. And as somebody who is my <clears throat> who is my mentor in college to, to say that about an event that I had planned as a student um, was really, really impactful for me. And it's an event that even um, when I went to a conference in DC, somebody started telling like the conference attendees about the event while I was in the audience. And I was like, hey, uh, that, like that was me. <laughs> um, wow. so, so that kind of thing. I'm really proud of that. That's so awesome. Very cool. Ben, do you mind going next? Mm. Well, you know, they used to have the gay pride parade and they started and I thought that's pretty great. And then, and then like, it wasn't like a parade. I was like, but about two years, two or three years ago, the gay pride parade was a parade and it was awesome. It was really awesome. And there was a lot of support from the community and a lot of people went. And I thought, this is really something really great. Um, and I was like, it was something that was celebrated and it wasn't just gay people that went. Um, there was, you know, in fact, I remember Jose Rodriguez, our state senator was, was, was you know, in it. And, and, I, and really what I was really proud of is that Walgreens was a big sponsor and supporter and they put themselves out there as really supporters and they marched in the parade and they were employees and I didn't know if they were gay or not but it didn't matter because they really took uh, you know for this town a big step and I was really proud of that and I was really proud and the other thing is that um, the the what is it the Salvation Army always rang bells in front of all kinds of places including Walgreens and they they don't do that in front of Walgreens anymore. So Walgreens is really a supporter. And the people in this town, I think, were um, really supportive. The other event was the, the remember the kissing thing at the, at the at, what was it? At uh, what, what was that restaurant? Chico's Tacos, that kissing restaurant. Yeah. And I was I watching know. TV, and I was watching TV, right? Mm -hmm. And they did the man on the street thing, and you think all these people are like, and they were just like really kind of normal El Paso ones, you know, these, Mexican Chicanos that still speak with a Spanish accent and they, they, they don't care about, I don't consider them supporters. And they, and they said, man, they have no, who cares? And you think like, I think I, did, I didn't believe that they were getting that response. People didn't think it was a big deal. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they were supporters, but I would say that people are uh, respectful enough to say, look, they're not hurting anybody. And that town didn't exist before that in, in El Paso. And um, so I'm really, I'm, these are small things, but they're, they're important changes. They're, they're the signs that this town is changing and that they are more, more accepting publicly. There's a lot of people that are very quiet about this issue and if their sons are gay or trans, they're supportive, but they don't wanna talk about it. Um, and, and this town didn't want to talk about this issue. But now there's a public discussion. And I think that's very important to have a public discussion and for them to realize that we're not invisible. <clears throat> Thanks, Ben. Um, and Diamond, did you want to introduce yourself and share a favorite El Paso Pride memory? Oh. Um, my name is Diamond Briseño. Um, I can honestly say it. Uh, I'm a native El Paso and I have, I have grown in the community. I mean, ever since, um, I guess, you can say everyone's tried to sneak in a, into a club or two when they're at uh, their youngest, but um, our only place to go was the OP. So, um, I mean, if you could recollect, um, or if any of you had the, uh, the blessing to be able to go to the old OP, you remember what it was like, what it was like in the community <clears throat> and how things were at that time and how things have progressed since then, because that used to be the place where no one would go unless they, you know, dare drive by, you know, or shout out obscenities and stuff like that. But um, being a performer in the, in the community has helped me you know, to travel and to, to reach other people. 
And um, with that being said, I my favorite memory I have to say was um, performing at the at, at the zoo when they had Pride at the zoo. I don't know if you remember that. Um, we weren't sh quite sure who was going to show up or how many people were going to show up because there were people um, picketing outside for like quite some time in the front. And uh, they showed us the venue and it was, it was a big venue. And we were like, well, with, you know, with the commotions that are going outside, we're not sure like how many people are not going to show up. And that was one of the nights that I did, uh, that I did Selena. But walking out there and walking to that amphitheater and seeing it completely filled by like all people, all cultures. There were women, there were small children, there were grown adults, you know, everyone, trans, everyone. It was just amazing. And just to see everyone come together like that, just, you know, in celebration. I mean, I even get kind of choked up when you, you see um, parents with their children coming up to a person they, they know, you know, they know you're trans or they want to, you know, a drag queen is that they see it, but they, they see beyond that. They see the celebration of life. And it was just an amazing experience to go out there and share that with everybody. And I feel that's, I think that's the way through entertainment that we allow people to, to feel like come together and be like, okay, we all can be entertained together. And this is what brings us together as a community. And I have to say like walking out there and I was like, <gasps> cause I, it was such an overwhelming feeling, you know, I was like, wow, these people, like they see beyond all that. They just, you know, see in the moment, the, the excitement and everything. And that was my favorite, I'd say. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Sounds awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Um, so I want to get started with some of the questions that I have for all of you, but just kind of a guideline as we have this conversation that I'd love for it to truly be a conversation. So if one of you wants to respond to another, you know, you don't need to ask me permission, feel free to jump in there um, and share your perspective on whatever it is we're talking about. Okay. Um, so even though I have some specific questions, I'd love for it to be as organic as possible. Um, but so one of the primary goals of this event is for all of us to kind of walk away with a better understanding of the current state of El Paso's LGBTQ plus community. So with that in mind, I wanted us to just start by kind of discussing the nature of El Paso's queer scene or scenes, if there are multiple. How would you describe the queer community here? And what do you think makes El Paso's LGBTQ plus community special? Ben, would you mind starting? Uh, I think what, I mean, for me, because I taught at the university for 23 years, it's not anything, it's like creative writers and their writers, I never had any kind of gay issues come up at all. It's like either they were gay and we're going to write about it or they weren't. I didn't, or I didn't have any gay people in my classes, which I think was pretty impossible. But through the years, um, the last three or four years that I taught, it was there's a lot of um, queer writers, and they wrote, very, you know, and they were very different. Some some of them were really out there about stuff, and some were just like, um, just writing about their experience of being gay people, queer people in El Paso, and they wrote beautiful things, and the other students were so moved by it. There was not one student in that class who was offended by anything that um, anyone wrote. And, and there was discussions about that. And also, and, and, and queer feminists that were really talking about and challenging other students um, about what feminism was and what it meant to be a queer feminist. Because I had several, and they were very outspoken, and they were very smart, and they were very articulate. And they took their colleagues on, and they would have not arguments, but really, um, well, very passionate discussions. And I stepped out of the way and let them, and I said, if my students are all talking and, and I step out of the way, this is when learning happens. And I thought that was really, for me, important because I thought whether these the students in my class were involved in any kind of um, gay rights activities, they were gay activists in the classroom. And that was amazing to me absolutely amazing. And I also think that um, what makes El Paso special is that, you know, we're a democratic town, but we're not necessarily a progressive town. And I think that that uh, the, the gay movement, the queer movement in El Paso is making El Paso more progressive. Um, because, and it, it, it's, it's tough. I know it's tough. And I've also been involved in in some fashions, in a lot of, you know, um, institutional 
things that uh, gay communities tried to set up. And, you know, they were very frustrating because they didn't work or um, like anybody else, we have people leading that shouldn't be, but we, but it, it's like, we're trying to do things. I, I love the, the, the center that we have. Um, and then I really, I re, then we have, I don't, is P flag still going? I know that Daniel Rowley set that up and, and that people, when I went, I went to speak and pe there was a lot of people there and I was really impressed. I do think we have a long way to go. I know that I think that I, I'd like to see like a leadership thing where people that are involved in different aspects of the gay community to get together and have like a leadership. I'd like to see us have, um, you know, everybody has, um, you know, black Democrats and, and, and whatever organization you have. And, and, and we, we should have, I'd like to have a gay political movement. So that candidates come to see us too. They go in front of everybody, Northeast people, and they go and the candidates go and they present their case and people are here. And then, and then they endorse them. They vote on it. They vote and they endorse some people. I'd like to see us endorse people. I'd like to see them recognize us as, as a power, as a political power. I, I'd like to see that. A, but I think that we, we have that here. We, we have everything that we need to do all of these things, to be, a, to be more political and, be, and count. And I also think um, I'd like to see an arts movement, an arts and literary movement for um, our young people, because I think it's important because arts really move people. Um, and I think we have a lot of artists here. We have a big music scene. We have a lot of talent and a lot of that talent is queer talent and to be able to, and we have that already. Mm -hmm. And just be, to, to be able to do something with that. Um, you know, so I, I think the city has a, a lot of potential and I've seen it change completely in my lifetime, which is amazing. It's really amazing. Um, and so I know that people, a lot of people say that we're not, we're not, we're, we're nowhere, but that, I think we're an amazing town. And I think that, the, and I see, when I see, I went to give, to give a talk at a school and there was these two guys holding hands at America's high school. And I thought, that's nice. I just think that's really beautiful. Would either of the um, Avery or Diamond like to chime in about what makes El Paso's LGBTQ plus community special? Sure. So, uh, um, a little more time answering that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to say um, what makes the El Paso LGBTQ community special here is like, uh, I would say like, we've all grown up together. We might be a small community, but we are indeed a family. Um, when we see something going out in the community, we're, you know, we're there to help out. We're there to find out what's happening and which way we can contribute to like it, say with, uh, with this past year, you know, we had things going on with COVID. We had a lot of people in the LGBTQ uh, community reaching out, you know, giving out meals, helping out where they can with toiletries, you know, helping out as a community. And I believe um, El Paso has come a long way. And I think we, we have to give a lot to like, um, you know, to, to the mainstream, you know, films and, and TV shows that have, I don't want to say like have made it comment on, on television, but they see it and they're, and they're giving an understanding of the people's lives and see us, you know, more as individuals. Whereas like growing up, I remember going to the OP, you know, as being as young as I was. And I was there when people would drive by to throw eggs and throw obscenities. And the only time they would show up was during Halloween, which, you know, they felt was acceptable, you know, to be who you are. But we're at a point now where um, we're trying to make it, you can be whoever you are whenever you want, not just on Halloween. And I see the more that um, people come out and see the community and um, join us such, such as like pride events, they see what we're about. They see, you know, love is love. And um, I do feel, you know, El Paso does have a long way to go. I mean, but you know, everyone has their own, um, has their own things going on and, you know, in their community and in their cities. But I, I think El Paso indeed is moving along. And as um, Ben mentioned earlier, you know, he saw people holding hands. We see that now like, oh, okay, well, that's very nice. You know, I wish I had that where like many years ago, it was, you know, unex it, people viewed as unacceptable or they'd roll down the window and say something awful, you know, and where now I think people are, um, I hate to say using the word normal. I hate that word normal, but people see it as like, oh, okay. Like Ben mentioned, you know, earlier, that's, that's very nice. You know, that's lovely because people are seeing love 
as, as something further than, you know, than their mind was, you know, earlier. And, um, and I, I feel like the community also is more open to more dialogue. Um, I've gone to Q and A's with like Texas Tech, um, UTEP Rainbow Initiative and, and also the FBI as I had to clarify a little earlier. Yeah, yeah. And it did, indeed it was the FBI and it was quite a shock to me because what they want to do is they want to ask questions on how to address the community. Cause you know, uh, you know, when you go to the doctor, doctors, you know, not everyone has all the answers, you know? So they have questions of their own of like how, you know, how to dress someone for the LGBTQ community or whatever questions they, they don't feel comfortable asking what is acceptable, not, not acceptable. So they are open for that dialogue, you know? And, and I see that's a step in its own for everybody else. One of the things that Ben mentioned uh, was kind of in terms of like how how much intellectual vitality and creative talent there is here in the commu queer community, it made me wonder if there also might be an issue with maybe everyday El Pasoans not realizing quite how much of a vibrant queer community there is in El Paso. Is, would, would you say that's true? Or one of the things I was wondering about too when I asked if it was like a scene or scenes is how many insular pockets there are or if there's like a lot of kind of unity. I don't know if any of you would like to answer that. I think a lot of people tend to venture out, especially like with, with the nightclub scene. I mean, people, business-wise, they wanna know what everybody else is doing. What is it attracting attention? How is it getting people here? So now they're trying to venture out, you know, outside of the box. So you see a lot of people, a lot of places, uh, other nightclubs, it would be um, otherwise like completely heterosexual. Go, let, let's see what the LGBTQ community is. You know, how are they bringing in people in, you know, as a business sense. And so, you know, also the gays like to go to the straight clubs too, because, you know, they, they want to get out and have a good time too at other places. And I see that, 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 uh, that join it of people, you know, almost as a curiosity, um, you know, it, 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 it makes them want to like venture out and try new things. And, and seeing that it becomes a culmination, you know, of people like, Okay, understanding to uh, understanding uh, each other on that level. I uh, wanted to add. I was I was listening to a podcast recently, which is how I started a lot of sentences. Um, but in that podcast, it, it mentioned that in a place, if I go to like Seattle or to Portland, someone will immediately read me as a transgender person, and they will know that like this bracelet means that I am trans and they may like be inclined to ask me what my pronouns are. Whereas in El Paso, like I just get read as a man, like people will just perceive me as a man and my pronouns are they, them and I'm non-binary. But here we don't have a lot of the language around queerness. And I think it's like that fact speaks to what you were saying about visibility of the queer community. Um, but I've been out as transgender for, for 10 years now and when I first came out, there was much less <laughs> visibility of the queer community. And there was a lot more like trans one-on-one -on -one workshops that we were doing, just explaining the very basics to people about what being transgender is, what the process of transitioning is. I would still get very invasive questions about what is in my pants or what is in my chest or like what I wanted to do for the next 20 years of my life. Um, as far as my transition goes. And I don't get those questions anymore from anybody. And I know that the, like, that is a low bar. Like, that is, that is a very low bar. Um, but that is like growth and improvement that I have seen in, in the last 10 years that I think is important to mention. Um, and a lot of this visibility, while I hate the ACLU and having to be legitimized by a, a constitution in some ways, because we're valid simply because we exist, um, these like court wins, I think El Paso is a community of like rule followers um, in a lot of ways. And as like these rules become accept these rules become acceptable, I think they like trickle down into being acceptable um, specifically in El Paso and in our communities. Thanks, Adri. And you actually really led into the next question that I wanted to ask, which um, so definitely in, like in the past several decades, there have been tremendous changes in this, the status of queer people in our society. Um, Diamond, you mentioned just like pop culture and like, you know, seeing like gay and transgender characters on TV. I mean, the, um, 
you know, the Supreme Court ruling that all states must allow gay marriage, all these things, like there's change happening that's been happening relatively recently. Um, but at the same time, homophobia and transphobia still play a huge role in shaping our world. Um, I was wondering if we could talk about some of the key challenges that still remain for LGBTQ plus El Pasoans in that pursuit of equality and combating discrimination and maybe that, you know, has to do with um, different policies or attitudes, um, both locally, statewide, and nationally. Adri, do you mind getting us started on this question? I missed the question because somebody <laughs> asked me for, for, for the link for the, for the webinar. <laughs> well, no worries. Ben, do you want to get us started? Well, I think one of the things that really plagues our world is toxic masculinity. And if we don't change that paradigm of masculinity, we're all, it's going to affect us all. And that's why I think police stations don't change. That's the problem. Toxic masculinity. And they bought it. And they can't get rid of it. And now we, we have to change that. And I think among um, a lot of gay young men that I know, I see them and they're my friends and I love them. And some of my former students and I have a lot of young people, I see them reproduce that masculinity within the gay community. You know, they just say, well, you know, I, I only date masculine men. That's a preference. That's just my preference. I would say bullshit. You know, why don't you think about this? It's bullshit. They don't think about, about what, what they're attracted to and why. There's a reason for that, you know, and I, and I really, um, they just bought it. They're just like, they're just like straight men, only they, you know, only they sleep with guys, but they're just like them. They, nothing's changed. Gay doesn't mean anything. Gay should mean, you know, I know I came out late, but you know what? It gave me a great opportunity to look at myself and say, Benjamin, what kind of man do you want to be? I get to do that. I get to decide that and become that. And uh, and that's in that's amazing. That's an amazing opportunity um, because that's identity. Not just it's like I want to be a man who is kind. I want to be a man who supports women. I want to be a man who supports transgender. I want to be a man that, that supports people to become themselves. That's what kind of man I want to be. And we can be, we can make ourselves um, into the kind of men we want to be, and we don't take that opportunity. And I think that our, our young men need a lot of education and they need models. <clears throat> and I think that we need to do that. I think that's, that's incumbent upon me you know, to do that. In fact, someday like next year, I want, I want to do a class on, um, uh, for, for gay young men on, on, on masculinity. And what does that mean within the context of being gay? And, and I really, this is so necessary because they don't talk about it. And I really, you know, if we don't, women are much, let's face it, women are much better than that. Women don't walk in a room and, and, and say, oh, I'm going to walk in a room and I'm going to prove I'm more woman than the other women. Women don't do that because they're not stupid. The, or men do that, that you a room full of men, gay or straight, they're, they're going to somehow going to assert and prove to the other men that they're men, which is stupid because we are men, all of us. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work to be done in this nation, but I think we have to do that in this community because that, because that whole thing is actually the root of violence. Can I, can I say something? Mm -hmm. um, I think all like policies that are anti-LGBTQ are, are fundamentally uh, because queer people uh, are a threat to uh, patriarchy and to uh, the rules of, this, <clears throat> to the way that this country was established uh, by and for white men. Um, and so I just like for all people who, who go against um, like the norm, not just men, um, that is something that is seen as a threat. I'm just repeating myself now, but uh, I'm, I lost my point, everybody. Please, somebody pick up. Well, well, I wanted to reiterate real quick for you, though, uh, what the, the key question that I posed at the start of this was, which is that what are some of the key challenges that remain for LGBTQ plus El Pasoans in the pursuit of equality and in combating discrimination, like homophobia and transphobia locally? 
Well, okay, thank you. That's helpful. I just, it's like, we have such a culture that is in, like inherently in, manch, in, in machismo because we are a community that is 85% Hispanic and 85% from Mexico. And like whether or not we, we are ready to grapple with, as Ben said, what masculinity means um, and how masculinity can, can come to mean something different. Um, anything that, that goes against that um, is fundamentally seen as a threat. And in some ways, um, I believe that performing to the standards that are acceptable in this country, specifically in our community, um, as a community of immigrants, is um, something that is seen as a requirement for success. <clears throat> and so that when we go against the grain or when we when we are queer, um, we are inherently seen as, as people who are not able to be as successful in this country as somebody else who is straight. Which is not true. Which is not true, no, no. But I think like that is where a lot of the homophobia like comes from in, in our families and in our communities. Um, because I do think that once you take the time to really sit down and talk to people, we are a very loving and understanding community, but it takes, I think, a lot of effort to pull that train along with you. Yeah, but you know, it's really interesting. It's, maybe it's about the programming we do. There's a high, a high school and middle school in Morton, and it's um, in Cicero, right out of Chicago, it's a suburb. It used to be an Italian neighborhood. It is now almost entirely Hispanic. Those two schools that I went to uh, talk to the kids, 80, the school was 85% Hispanic. And we had this thing at night where we're gonna talk to the parents and they knew I wrote this book about two you know, gay boys in 1987 that fell in love and they were reading the book. And so we had a program for, for you know, parents. We, 300 mothers showed up. They were all from Mexico. <clears throat> and their children were here. They're all from Mexico. And all they asked me about all night was about being gay and how can they help their sons. Now, there wasn't one man there. But these mothers know that their sons are gay or queer or maybe trans. They know their kids need help and they, they want to support them and they don't know how. And, and you have one public thing and they come. Because they don't, know what to do. they don't know what, and it was amazing. I, it was the most amazing night, four hours, we stayed talking. And okay. I feel like going back on like what you said, Ben, a lot of times the, the parents are the ones that have questions themselves. Um, I went for a talk at an elementary school and they had, um, they had a child that did, I, I, I don't even want to, even want to say identify as trans, like the, the child knew he was a boy and, and that was it. And the thing is that the child didn't have any problems. I went to speak to the school and it was, uh, it was, it was the parents and it was the teachers and the principal. And I, um, I, I wanted to know, well, they wanted to talk to me, see how I felt about it and what questions they might have. And their quest, my questions to them were, um, is this, is this child a problem? Uh, do they not, uh, do they not succeed academically? Do they get, get along well with other children? You know, do, do they fight? Are they problems? Like, no, the kid does well in school you know, acts accordingly with the other kids, you know, he plays with, with, the, with the other boys accordingly, you know, he, he knows which restrooms, he, you know, he's, he's safe to use. And the only people really that had the problem were the parents because they didn't, they didn't understand like exactly, you know, um, how to deal with the child. I was like, let the child be a child right now. That's, that's all he knows. He doesn't know anything about, you know, anything about sexuality or, you know, the parts or this, not all the kid knows is like, this is what I am and this is what I'm living. But at the same time, the parents, well, as a matter of fact, the, the, the main parent of the child, uh, the father, as you mentioned, was there, uh, he wasn't, he wasn't present at the meeting, but the mother was, and you know, she, she was, she was concerned and she had, she had a lot of questions, you know, bless her heart. And the thing is, is that the good thing is like they're, they're open, you know, to wanting to help their children. Whereas like, if you're from the old school parents, don't want to talk about it. They don't want to address anything. They want to leave in the closet. It doesn't exist and it doesn't happen, you know. But I, I feel now, um, as I mentioned, you know, things are going mainstream and people are watching these. Even the comfort of, of your home, everyone during COVID had some alone time. <laughs> everyone had some time to reflect and watch Netflix like 10,000 times. So you, you happen to, if any person happened to run across a movie that happened to have, you know, LGBTQ issues, I'm sure they had questions of their own and hopefully like some understandings of like, you know, what other people in our community go through. So, I mean, I, I do believe, you know, 
as long as people are open for questions and are, are showing up, as you said, and want to help their children, there is some hope. You know, and I think it's like, I really have gotten involved in a lot of these issues because, you know, I write for young adults. And of course, my my main character, they always have to do with, you know, gay, gay men or women. In one case, it was a gay father. In Aristotle and Dante, it's two gay men who, who were trying to discover what it means to be a gay guy. But I get letters from all over the place. And I get letters from people who... Are, are trying to love their children. And I get letters from from this, from in El Paso. And they're, I, this, you know, my Facebook friends, and I may know them, I may not know them, but they're on Facebook. And they write me, well, my, my niece or nephew or my son or daughter, or uh, they're, they're, they're changing sexes and, and, and I wanna love them. I don't know what to do. What should I read? You know, I'm no expert on this, but I do have access to like, I, I sent them the, the, be, the top 10 best representations of transgender in young adult literature, and they can read that. And they do. But, but I see that they're struggling and they, and in this community and that they love them. They love their nephew, niece, and daughter, but they're just like, and, and they, they don't know what to do. And, you know, I have a friend of mine that's a very good friend of mine, and, and, and he's, um, um, non-binary, and and I'm really I've been close friends with him for a long time, and I told him once, and I I, I really I was I was crying. I said I I, I miss I won't say his name, but I, I named his name. I said I miss him. I loved him, and I love you, but he's not. He doesn't exist like that anymore, and it, and I have to mourn him. So how much must a parent feel? It's not that we don't support them. It's that we met them as something and we adored them and we adore them still, but it's changed and, and, and he will never exist as he was, but he exists as he is. But I needed my time of mourning, but I wanted to tell him that because I love him. And I, and I don't want to be silent about the people that lo love transgender people go through their own mourning and then rejoicing, but we have to mourn. And, but, but I think that, it, it's really important, you know, like, as they said during the AIDS pandemic, silence does equal death. John, I really appreciate you sharing that because um, you kind of segued into one of the questions that we got from the audience. And I wanna make sure we have time to get through the audience questions, um, which if, if anybody else has any others that you'd like to add to the chat, now's the time. Um, but Oscar asks, what's the biggest concern regarding trans kids and teens? Can I answer? Go for it. Um, I, I mean, my biggest concern right now regarding trans kids and teens is that they're being used as a way for, for very powerful and very large um, conservative uh, Republican led organizations as like a political wedge issue to distract from the things that they're not doing for or to benefit literally anybody. We like have just got out of a pandemic and instead of doing anything to get relief into people's hands, um, there are states all across the country trying to pass anti-trans legislation that specifically targets transgender children. And so there are kids who are six years old, who are now 10 years old, who are 17 years old um, that I work with on an almost daily basis. And I am worried about their long-term mental health and what this means for them as they move through their lives when their youth has been so impacted and fraught with like having to defend their very existence. Um, I mean, that's, that's my current biggest concern, right? Kids um, broadly require um, above all a, a safe environment and a safe container to live and thrive. And so some of that can be mediated just by having a safe at home environment. But what about the kids who don't have a safe at home environment, right? Like, I know that there's a lot more of those than the ones that we're seeing show up to the Capitol each and every day. Um, yeah, and I, those kids. And I like to tell people, and I like to tell people, they say, well, because people are distanced from it. And even though they think, well, I'm, I'm, I support them. Why we should be more involved in, in fighting that trans, transphobia is that because we have to realize that all children are, I don't have any kids, but all children 
our children. We're, as adults, we are charged with taking care of the children of the world, wherever they're from. And if we see children, all children, as some that we have to take care of them, that we, we have to take care of them, and not as other people's children. Poor, poor, the poor Mexican children are my children. And I have to look at life that way and then vote that way and think that way and fight my politics that way. And, and as, if, as long as we see children, all, all, we saw all children as our children, we could change the world, but we don't. It's somebody else's problem, somebody else's kid. That's not true. You know, I feel as, as, uh, as an adult writing for young people that, that my readers are my children. And I want, I write to give them hope because I think the world, um, the world seems to want to take all their hope away. And I want to give it back to them. And we, if, if we as adults said, mm -hmm. that's my issue. If we said that transgender issue is my issue. If not just their issue, it's my issue. And if we did that, then, and, and taught, e taught each other to think that way, which is, I think, what we have to do. I think that's absolutely what we have to do. Thank you, Ben. Um, we have another question from Fernanda, who asks whether you all think that the COVID pandemic made the LGBTQ experience or life worse. And I, I was also wanting to ask about that, but also just about how things are looking as, as the newly vaccinated world begins to open back up. Like what has changed or where, where are we now and how does how did COVID-19 affect the LGBTQ community in El Paso? I, I believe the COVID, COVID affected everyone. I right. mean, but as far as the LGBTQ community, you know, for those people who do feel at their loneliest, I mean, I, I believe it, it did in some sense like make it worse because, you know, for people who had, you know, had organizations to go to, who had made, you know, their, their own family of friends, you know, of a community weren't, weren't able to go out, you know, to those places where they can commune and, and not feel alone as they were. I mean, solitude is, especially if you're used to like being around a lot of people all the time and all, all of a sudden you're stuck and crammed inside your house, you know, every day with your house plant with nothing to say, you know, um, it, it does take its toll, especially like if you don't have any family, you know, around and you don't have that, that support that you would otherwise have, you know, from, you know, from people. Cause you know, at, at some time or some point of another, if you are part of the LGBTQ community, you know, about like being turned away from your family and not having anybody. And um, I, I just think that now that things are opening up, people are willing just to, to get outside. They don't even care where, you know, just to be around other people and be able to, um, to commute and share with one another. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm lost for words in terms of that. You know, uh, I went through my own stuff personally as well, but you know, you know, we have to like be strong and reach out to one another and, you know, share our experiences, which is why we are on here, you know, so that people understand a little bit more where we're coming from and so that they know that they're not alone. I'm really glad you mentioned that diamond. I think it's so important to mention the specific mental health impacts on the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah, and um, I think I think it was worse for kids because they don't they don't get to be kids like we got to be kids and we, they, they miss they <clears throat> something from their childhood. And older LGBTQ plus people, I think for the older and the younger, it was worse. You know, you know, and and and. I, you know, I can't imagine, you know, being, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like a senior citizen. Um, I smile when I say that, uh, but I am, you know, and I, I wasn't, I, for me, it was a good thing, but I had a community. I have two people who work for me and they're like my assistants and stuff, and they were here and they live here. And so I had my community. And so I, and, and it was great. And then I have, of course, my little, you know, my little Yorkie, you know, who's, you know, the only guy I will ever sleep with again. You know, I, I love this guy. And I, you know, and so I, I made the best, I, I finished a novel. I finished the bulk of the, the sequel to Aristotle and Dante during the COVID. And it was a book that needed to be written then. 
because it mirrors the, the, the AIDS pandemic. I make it made it mirror what's going on today. And it was I was able to write a book because of the pandemic that I think is going to be a lot better and I'm going to speak to more people. But I'm very unique that way. You know, I am I am and, and I really I felt that I had some friends and and I, I, I just wanted to go see them. In fact, I almost did, and I shouldn't want because it was it was dangerous. But I also think um, for for me, you know, I think there's a lot of um, still a lot of promiscuity in in the gay community, and that's fine. Who cares? But the COVID was not a good time to be sleeping around, you know. So you know, I think that was good for a lot of people to think about, um, and. I'm really glad that you mentioned the kind of plus side to the COVID-19 pandemic, because I think uh, you're not alone in terms of, you know, so many queer artists in El Paso made a lot of incredible work this past year. And I've even been seeing, you know, album rollouts and things of all the, the incredible creative energy that was poured out through this period of isolation. But I do, we, we don't have too much time left and we've gotten a lot of really incredible questions from the audience. So I want to try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, so ML Flowers asked, can someone speak to the extent of power that our local reps have when it comes to combating statewide transphobic and homophobic leg legislation? And are there any candidates to keep an eye on as we try to get these homophobic, transphobic reps out of office? Um, this feels specifically targeted to what I do for my job. Uh, we actually have a really great delegation. We have one of the first openly uh, gay representatives, Mary Gonzalez, it, who is from El Paso serving Socorro District. Um, and she was part of the people who started the LGBTQ caucus at the Texas House of Representatives, which is incredible. Um, and then Joe Moody, who is a representative for the West Side, is like the second in command of the House of Representatives. Um, she was a professor at UH, no, it's Mary Gonzalez. And uh, both of them were, I don't, this is like not a good answer, both of them were really essential in stopping all of the anti-trans legislation through like a lot of bathroom meetings and a lot of text messages. Um, and we probably couldn't have done it without them to be quite honest. <laughs> and the, all the like anti-trans, um, representatives are not from El Paso, Texas. And at the very least, I think we have that to be really proud of um, for our for our statewide delegation. Do you, yeah. think, do you think it would be a good idea to push uh, city reps to pass a, a, some kind of referendum of support? So what we don't do, what we don't have in El Paso that other cities in Texas do have is a comprehensive non-discrimination ordinance that applies to all of the citizens of, of the city of El Paso. We have one that applies to municipal employees. Um, but we don't have one that applies to all of the citizens. And I think this also speaks to a point that Ben made earlier about the El Paso LGBTQ community is that we haven't really worked in such a way to build organized political power. Um, we have businesses that are LGBTQ friendly, but again, that just feeds into like the same, the same kind of scene that we've had for several years where bars are the only safe spaces for LGBTQ people. But we need to, I think, move beyond that in such a way that the businesses are using their, their capital, their financial power to push for LGBTQ candidates in this city um, to run for office and promote LGBTQ policies. We don't have um, an LGBTQ uh, chamber of commerce um, necessarily. Um, I think we might have started one actually recently in the last two years in the pandemic, but it's like very new. And so how do we use that to, to actually build political power in the city? Thank you, Adri. Um, I wanna get to a couple more of these questions if possible. Um, Jocelyn asked, earlier y'all mentioned that El Paso is seen as a place for queer El Pasoans to flee from. What would El Paso look like or be like as a place where queer people feel safe enough to stay? And asking this as an El Pasoan who's living in Houston, missing my hometown so much. El Paso is the place where I learned the word pansexual, which is the only word I've ever felt sufficient to describe how I love. Thanks, Jocelyn, for sharing that. I believe that, and I can say for myself, everyone that leaves El Paso eventually comes back. I mean, I'm sure all of you who live here have known that. I've done it myself. But it's, I, a disease, it's a disease. Have, we have it. Yeah, We're never going to get rid of it. Back. You just have to come back to El Paso. It's just a, 
it's just a wonderful place to be. I moved out of town thinking, okay, maybe I, I need to try something else. Maybe I'm the, in the wrong place or, you know, or maybe let me find out if, if my, you know, if, it, if I'm the problem, you know, and, and figure it out. I went out of town. I didn't like it. I wanted to be here. I, you know, the, the community here is my family. And that's why I chose to come back because I did, I miss it. I mean, um, that's El Paso. As I keep mentioning it earlier, we're a community of people that grew up together. I mean, I, I once remarked to a friend one time and I said, you know what, how I wish I would have been able to grow up with, with the same friends from elementary school. And I thought about it in perspective. I was like, you know what, I don't need that because I have a whole community of people that I grew up with since I found myself. And that's what brought me back here. Thank you, mm -hmm. um, So I think we have time for one more question. Joshua asked, how do you reconcile the struggles of queer people in El Paso with the ongoing economic exploitation of the city's cultural, historic, artistic ep epicenters? And the example they used is Duranguito. What are some of the ways that we can or should connect and resist these two struggles? Does anyone want to take that on? I just uh, want to say <laughs> that ever since August 3rd, um, everything is in some way related to white supremacy and uh, the same uh, economic exploitation of the city's cultural, historic, and artistic epicenters where they're trying to destroy Duranguito to build a, a stadium and also uh, promote that gross life in the glass beach study that promotes a new El Paso that looks like Matthew McConaughey. Um, all of that is like an endeavor of uh, white supremacy. So, and I think that ties into anti-LGBTQ rhetoric as well. Yeah, and I think the fight that we should be fighting and winning is uh, the cultural center. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people who aren't uh, gringos who aren't Mexican and they say well why do we need one because everyone here is Mexican and I tell them you know the only people who, who feel that way are gringos because we don't feel that way this we live in different worlds and I reminded them that so I said if you don't know why we need one we can have no discussion here because it's about how we need that kind of um, cultural center that's Mexican American cultural center because people are so unaware of where we've traveled from and a lot of historical things that happened that are that said the community hated us and in some and so in some circles we are I don't want to say hated but we're not respected you know and I think that there's still some underlying ideologies that are very racist. And I think we need to have a cultural center that points that out. And I think that's very important because it's very public and we have to have, and it has to be that, and we have to insist on that. And, and, and if we have to, you know, tear down city hall, this is our fight because there we can also put, uh, I, I want to do a whole um, oral history if I could, if I live long enough. Uh, Mexican American men and women who were gay or transgender or lesbians, I want to do their oral histories and what they have gone through and put it in that cultural center and say, look, this is what, look at how brave we are. Look at how amazing we are. We should be proud of that. Our people, just Mexican American people have survived incredible things. And I'm proud to be a gay Latino, not just gay, but a gay Latino. And I think that we need to, to, to say, we're really proud of that and you don't know anything about us and we're gonna educate you. And we're gonna have a cultural center that's gonna educate you. And I think that's really, really important because I think that could, that center could change the city in many ways. But also one that like gives us something to be proud of and like see ourselves reflected in that space. There is a long history of like trans uh, Mexican American people in this country dressing up in like pachuco suit suits and like that isn't taught anywhere. I, and I had no idea that existed until I went to a conference somewhere far away in another part of the country. So having that like be here and something where you can see yourself in a museum, it gives you a different sense of like what you're able to accomplish in life. 
um, not just like that you see people that look like you on the street or in grocery stores, like seeing yourself like commemorated in a space. Thank you all so much. We are out of time, but I am so <laughs> glad that we were able to have this wide ranging conversation. And I feel like I learned a lot. Um, thank you to our audience for participating and being here. Um, and I also want to thank Literary Bookshop for sponsoring tonight. Um, so please uh, go, go to alpasomatters.org to see our unique in-depth reporting about our region. Um, our journalism is made possible by support from people like you. So please consider becoming a member of El Paso Matters. And um, there should be a link in the chat to visit our donation page and our free newsletter subscription page. Um, at, is it, has it been added? I'm scanning down, or it's gonna be added momentarily. Um, <laughs> we'll be announcing our next events in the newsletter. So definitely sign up for that newsletter to find out when that will be and who it will be. Our goal is to have these talks once a month um, and, you know, eventually, I don't think too much farther in the future, we'll be transitioning to in-person events. Uh, thank you, everybody, so much for being here tonight. And uh, this will be posted online uh, later because we recorded tonight's event. So, Diamond, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure meeting you all. Have a great one. Be safe and stay hydrated. <laughs>